friends, it's uh, 3.45, um, uh, 9.45 in Jerusalem, or is it 10.45? 10.45. Um, the Archbishop Wadir and Don can see the entire room, so they're aware that we've gathered because uh, we love them, we love their ministry, and we love the work they're doing. Uh, so let's just pause and uh, pray. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Loving God, every human being is precious in your sight. And we weep for the land of our Lord Jesus Christ. We weep for the human lives that are desolate and despairing, fearful and afraid, mourning those they love. Loving God, be with those who are in leadership roles in that part of the world. Give them a sense of your presence. Give them your wisdom. Enable them to find the words that are necessary for any moment and situation they face. We ask all this in the name of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. It is um, a poignant moment today. Um, the seminary has always been part of the journey of the world in which we serve. Uh, it's interesting, you know, if you go back to 1823, that was the year that Stephen S. Austin received a grant of land in Texas. Uh, Rossini premiered an opera in Venice. So we've always been part of this world. And at any moment, something that's happening elsewhere in the world could carry extraordinary significance such that in 200 years' time, people are continuing to talk about that day and that occasion and that moment. And therefore, when we heard that the Archbishop was unable to attend, it's obviously a matter of deep sadness. Um, Arch Archbishop Hossam has, is a graduate twice over at this institution with both an MDiv and a D-Min from Virginia Theological Seminary. And he's joined from Jerusalem with Wadir and with Don. So I'm going to invite Wadir and Don to convey their greetings and uh, give us a sense of uh, the moment from their perspective. And Wadir, as you're the most recent graduate of Virginia Theological Seminary, I invite you to go first. Well, greetings everyone. Uh, good afternoon. It's lovely to be back on the Holy Hill, although virtually. I was really looking forward to being with you all in person. Um, and it's always a pride and honor to be part of this ever-expanding family, to be part of the history of this seminary that has been um, giving um, faithful ministers into the church and allowing us to be part of God's ministry here on earth. So uh, congratulations to us all as part of this family, and may God bless us while we're doing God's ministry here on earth, and may God bless the seminary with its administration, faculty, and staff and students while they're doing God's um, work. So greetings from Jerusalem to you all. Thank you very much, Wadia. And Don, please. Yes, greetings to Jerusalem to you all, and a joyous bicentennial to you, uh, especially if there's any there from the class of 1989 or that ancient era in general. <laughs> I'd like to say, too, that uh, it was as a uh, seminarian in 1988, May of 1988, that I first came to Jerusalem uh, on a month-long study course at St. George's College, and I fell even more in love with the Holy Land at that time uh, and have had a deep connection uh, with it ever since, leading to my serving here uh, after putting in 30 years as a parish priest in the United States and serving as a missionary here for these past five years. Uh, lots of things have happened that we didn't expect, including this past week. And I'm sure you'll, uh, the Archbishop will tell you more about that. 
we ask for your continued prayers and support, uh, uh, especially now because we desperately need them. Uh, the people uh, in and around Gaza desperately need them. Uh, this whole region needs your prayers and support. Uh, God bless you all and uh, stay in touch. Thank you very much. Um, so now let's, uh, th there's a sense in which the Archbishop needs no introduction. Um, you've been a, a close and dear friend of the seminary and we're hugely grateful for everything you've done and everything you represent. Um, so I'm going to be the only person asking questions. That's partly because we want to make, I've, I've given him the list of questions I'm proposing to ask him. So there are no surprises. It is, this is such a sensitive time. Um, you know, there's a, a need to be especially careful. Um, so, so Archbishop, thank you so much for joining us. And um, we appreciate it's both late and I'm sure it's extraordinarily stressful for you and uh, your, your ministry. So let's just start with that question. You know, how's your family? How's Rafa and your children? Uh, and how are you coping in this extraordinarily uh, difficult moment? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dean Ian, and uh, thank you to all our friends on the Holy Hill. And uh, we are very much delighted uh, to be together, uh, as Father Odia said, a bit uh, virtually. And we were very much hoping to be with you um, to celebrate together, uh, to be present, and uh, to uh, just enjoy the wonderful ministry that we have uh, uh, celebrating at this time. And uh, of course, as, as Dean Ian said, twice graduate and then an honorary degree as well. So uh, the three of us are very much delighted to be with you at this time. And thank you very much, uh, Dean uh, Ian, for, for your question about the family. Um, the children are doing fine. Wadia is um, going into university this year, We're doing our, uh, architecture. And uh, the girls are um, also in school. And uh, Luis will be graduating. Uh, this this year from high school, and uh, I'm sure that uh, many of you remember, uh, especially Wadia and Maurice uh, when they were tiny, uh, four and two, uh, when we were staying with you in, in 2009. So uh, Rafa is doing fine, and um, uh, she also, with the children, send their love to you all at this time and congratulate uh, Virginia Theological Seminary for its wonderful ministry and witness uh, to our Lord. Thank you. We're delighted to hear the family are doing so well. I, I do remember them. And uh, it's amazing how, you know, university is looming already. It's, it's extraordinary. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, Hamas and Gaza. You did issue a statement with the patriarchs and the heads of the church in Jerusalem. And your statement stressed the need to respect the, and I quote, historic and legal status quo of the holy shrines. You also unequivocally condemned any acts that target civilians, and you asked for political leaders to engage in dialogue and find lasting solutions. So I, th I thought the threefold nature of that statement was, from my perspective, very helpful. You know, the first is those historic and legal status quo of the holy shrines, um, the unequivocal condemnation of any acts that target civilians, and the need for political leaders to engage in dialogue and find lasting solutions. So, so I, I have two questions, if I may, Archbishop. The first is, I love the fact that you do this work ecumenically, but I was just curious, you know, the statement came out quite quickly, so I, is, is it harder to agree with a group of people, these sorts of statements, or did you find that unity was arrived at pretty quickly? And then secondly, how's the statement been received? Uh, what's your perspective of the way the statement's been received in both yeah. Israel, Palestine, and beyond? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dean Ian, for the question. And actually, as a matter of fact, we just issued a second statement this, um, this afternoon, or this evening, actually, um, here in Jerusalem. Uh, and I really encourage you as well to have a look at it uh, and speak into more specific um, uh, situation that is happening now, uh, especially with our, um, uh, you know, Christian community and the wider community of Gaza, uh, especially under the siege. And because, you know, we just learned that uh, all southern um, uh, Gaza Strip were asked to move into the south. 
and evacuate. So we had to kind of issue another statement uh, stressing the importance that, you know, we, uh, as in the first statement, saying that, you know, we have also to protect the rights of uh, civilians and the safety and, and, and all of that. You know, like the ecumenical, um, um, I would say, leadership in, in Jerusalem is, is a wonderful witness to the uh, Christian community here in Jerusalem and for the whole world, uh, especially in the, in the cradle um, place of our faith, you know, Jerusalem, where everything started. I know that we are uh, diverse communities and uh, different churches, but we work together in, in, in a wonderful way, united together for the common good of our communities, uh, and uh, work uh, very hard in order to ensure that, you know, the smooth running of uh, uh, welcoming pilgrims into the Holy Land and also taking care of our communities that are spread in a very diverse, very complicated area within Israel, Palestine, Jordan, and sometimes even uh, wider than that, including Syria and Lebanon and Cyprus uh, and other places within the Middle East. Uh, but I can I can say that, you know, um, it doesn't take, it used to, like I would say maybe 20 or 50 years ago, take a long time to agree to a statement. Uh, but now, because of the, um, the trust that has been built among the heads of churches, we issue statements within, um, you know, like 24, 48 hours, depending. But the last statement was actually agreed on within two hours. Uh, uh, for the urgency of the statement that we issued today. And here I would like also to thank Canon Don for his hard work as well with us and with the heads of churches and me and him, you know, between the, the responsibilities we share, the secretariat of the uh, heads of churches and the council in, in Jerusalem. But I really kind of really urge you to continue to, play, to pray for uh, uh, the people of the region here um, for all civilians, especially at this time, who are struggling, who are grieving, who are injured, um, and for protection from heaven um, at this very difficult time for uh, our peoples here in this land, especially the Holy Land, that really needs um, uh, intervention, heavenly intervention, and a lot of international intervention to um, cease fire and that life can go to some kind of normalcy after this, uh, these dreadful events that have taken place. It, 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 how many churches are actually involved? How many heads of churches uh, coming together for this sort of statement? Uh, so basically, we are uh, 13 uh, recognized churches. It's a complicated issue, but you know, because of we have inherited uh, a kind of um, a long um, historic arrangement uh, within the Holy Land, and it was inherited from the Ottomans into the uh, British mandate and then into the Jordanian rule. Uh, and now with the Israelis and the Palestinians. So the status quo that was referred to in the statement speaks about special uh, recognition for uh, specific religions within the area. And when we talk about 13 heads of churches, we speak about um, uh, four families, um, mainly the evangelical family or the Protestant family, and that is the Anglicans and the Lutherans. Uh, and then the Catholic families, which includes Roman Catholics and the Maronites, Greek Catholic and uh, uh, Armenian Catholic and Syrian Catholic, and then the Orthodox um, uh, Church, uh, which is the most kind of one of the ancient and historic churches with the Patriarch Theophilus as the head of the um, basically like first among equals, although we don't use that term, but he's the uh, kind of uh, senior among uh, the heads of churches, and then the Oriental Orthodox that includes the Armenians. Uh, the Syrian Orthodox uh, and the uh, Coptic Church and the Ethiopian Church. Mm, yes, I mean, I mean that's amazing that they come together for statements like this, and and um, I've not had the opportunity to read, and I will do so. The statement you've just issued, um, but I got a sense from what you said that the emphasis there is this principle that civilians should not be harmed needs to be part of this um, yes. moment. And, and that Absolutely. was what you very much wanted to stress, I assume. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, the Anglican Episcopal Diocese of Jerusalem runs a hospital in Gaza. Um, do you have a sense of how the staff are coping there? Uh, are you trying to... Uh, are you encouraging them to move? Are, is the hospital still functioning? Um, 
how do you make these decisions and judgments uh, which are so important and difficult? Yeah, uh, indeed, you know, I, at this time, you know, um, the hospital is going through a very difficult time and um, we have issued a statement, again, internal statement this time from the Anglican Church, from the Episcopal Church in Jerusalem asking uh, for uh, help um, in order to cope with the, the huge responsibilities and the dangers that surround the hospital at this time. And uh, um, unfortunately, the hospital is um, running on a very, um, uh, I would say, low fuel in, when it comes to supplies, you know, medical supplies, food, water, uh, and electricity. But I have to say at the same time, like the hospital has been a, a wonderful witness at this very dark time where uh, the hospital is welcoming all sorts of uh, surgeries um, and uh, injuries, and especially our burn unit and the other units within the hospital that are doing um, significant work of uh, healing and healthcare at this time. Um, and I have to say, like, through the, the help of our friends, uh, especially the American Friends of the Diocese of Jerusalem and other partners, uh, we have equipped the hospital with, uh, I would say, a plan to survive in such time of crisis uh, for at least a month, you know, to uh, cater whether with the solar system that has been installed in the, in the hospital and also uh, the uh, other means. I don't want to name them now for security reasons, but at least, you know, at least in the hospital is there to um, function as much as possible in the, in the uh, light of what is, what is happening. Uh, the hospital itself um, is a 60 bed hospital that uh, operates um, in an extraordinary way. And I had, I had the privilege to visit the hospital uh, a week ago, actually, um, uh, or maybe eight days ago, just two days before the, um, uh, the last incidents that took place. And I was accompanied by the Bishop of Norwich uh, and, and Canon Don also was, was with me. And we went to visit the hospital and to kind of talk about future uh, plans and, uh, and, you know, strategic plan for the hospital and all of that and to make sure that the employees are also taken care of and all of this. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, after two days, um, um, we have witnessed the, uh, the, these events that took place. Uh, now the hospital also serves as as place of refuge for uh, many people whose homes also been destroyed, and now unfortunately our Christian community, which is we count 1,000 Christians in the whole strip of Gaza, mainly they are in Gaza City, uh, and now they are displaced in three play main places. That's the hospital and the two churches in in Gaza, the Roman Catholic Church and the Greek Orthodox Church. Uh, and I hope that nothing will uh, befall uh, them because, you know, that means that will be the end of our uh, Christian presence in, in Gaza if, God forbids, it, something happens and uh, these three institutions or uh, churches, uh, holy places will be, uh, God forbids, it, destroyed. So 60 beds. Uh, how many employees in the hospital? No, we yeah, so we, we have the main, they are like about, uh, I would say, about 70 employees, but they are also part-timers. So all in all, I think we have something up to 125 employees in, in total. And there are also con other contractors and consultants that also come to the hospital to, that we benefit from their services. And, and has the evacuation order implied that people should move further south away from... Uh, the hospital yeah so if you imagine like uh, gaza as a triangle um, um and like if you look at my screen um so that's the way and uh, over my head is the sea so basically gaza city is where where my head is uh in in the middle of the gaza strip so they're asking everything from uh, from this the, um, let me say this side um, um to move into the south um, and that's that's the the situation right now. So basically, half of Gaza in the north will move to the south, uh, and we are talking about 1.1 million uh, um, people basically uh, are asked to evacu evacuate. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, it's it's horrendously complex. Um, I, I I just want to touch on you know you were actually 
hosting the International Commission for Anglican Orthodox Theological Dialogue. So perhaps that was the reason why the Bishop of Norwich was yes. in, in, uh, able to visit uh, Gaza. Um, so, so, you know, you're, you're moving from this very important theological work to this extraordinary, heartbreaking political and humanitarian crisis. Um, I, I assume the International Commission isn't trying to carry on meeting, and are you trying to get them out of the country, or, or what do you do in these situations? Uh, so basically, we, we were supposed to finish uh, um, on the 12th, uh, but by the 11th, everybody, almost everybody, was uh, out of the country in many different ways. Some had to go to Jordan uh, to cross over the bridge and then fly from Amman. Uh, and some, we managed to get them on a flight because uh, Tel Aviv airport was not operating um, uh, on full stance. So basically, uh, lots of flights got cancelled and all of that. But we have actually uh, the good news of the dialogue between the Anglican and the Orthodox uh, church, which is, this is the international commission uh, that met in Jerusalem. We have uh, actually finished and finalized the, uh, our discussion on bioethics, and this time the, the theme was uh, organ donation. Uh, and that was a kind of, a, a kind of an, an, somehow an uncommon theme uh, to be discussed, but we went into depth to issue that statement, which we called actually the Jerusalem statement. And if people would like to know more about that, there was a communique that was issued uh, a few days ago about um, this dialogue. Uh, so if you can Google that, uh, the um, Anglican Orthodox dialogue in Jerusalem and the organ donation, you can fee see more uh, details about that. But it was absolutely a blessing to be together. Uh, and again, this is another arm of uh, ecumenical, a wonderful ecumenical ministry where we visited Mount Tabor in Galilee for the Transfiguration. And also we visited uh, the Holy Sepulchre and the two major uh, services happened, one in the cathedral here at St. George's and one on Calvary, uh, where the Greek Orthodox uh, Patriarch and Representative and uh, Greek Orthodox Bishops uh, concelebrated together the Holy Eucharist on one of the most uh, holy places in the Holy Land, and that is uh, Calvary, Golgotha. Uh, so we prayed uh, during the week, uh, whole week, because we, uh, during the conflict, we were meeting, but uh, the situation was constantly in our prayer as we were praying for all people on all sides and for safety, especially for women and children and vulnerable people uh, that were suffering um, uh, huge atrocities at that time. And, and did... Most of the participants in the commission who are not living in Jerusalem, or have they made their way back to? Everybody, everybody left, and they're, they're all back safe in their homes right now. Yeah. Um, now, in, in situations like this, um, I'm sure you you do need to think a little bit about the guidance you want to give your clergy about addressing these themes on a Sunday. Um, especially aware that um, something m misspoken uh, could create significant challenges. Um, so have you issued advice to your clergy about how to address uh, the unfolding tragedy? Yeah, indeed. So uh, they, they, they will be mainly guided by the statements that we have issued, and I will be also issuing tomorrow a pastoral letter um, uh, to uh, the diocese and to our people uh, here in the region um, in order to continue to pray. And we, uh, as the heads of churches, we have also called the 17th of October uh, to be a day of prayer and fasting. And if any of you would like uh, feel school to do that, that would be also a, absolutely a spiritual gift for Jerusalem to join us in, in fasting and in prayer. Uh, and, and normally, like you know, people like take also the opportunity for Sunday worship to preach um, uh, the word of God. Of course, the Sunday we have uh, the um, uh, people in uh, Jesus's encounter with the Pharisees and the question about authority and the um, the uh, you know like the tax to Caesar. Uh, so they, we have a theme, maybe a window about thinking about temporal and spiritual matters and how we as people of God try to kind of bring God's reconciliation in our 
uh, mortal world and uh, our uh, difficult situations, we will find, you know, a quite tricky and uh, a difficult situation, dilemmas, so to speak, is how do we speak in these times of uh, uh, um, uh, violence and the uh, people calling uh, each side is trying to kind of pull uh, uh, the people or the kind of the media to their own side. Uh, it's it's uh, politics can be very difficult and sorry to say sometimes dirty game. Uh, and how our people, our clergy specifically, try to educate our people how to respond. Uh, spiritually and faithfully and ethically to this situation uh, is something of great value and uh, how they address our own people is really important. You asked previously about how people received statements. Um, uh, as you can imagine, Dean Ian, and I'm sure that the people who are also uh, hearing at this moment, anything we say about difficult issues, um, um, not all people respond in the same way. So you will find whatever you're going to say is going to be problematic somehow because some people will not agree. Some people will think that the statements or what we say is not strong enough. Some people will say you should have been prophetic in your in what you say. Uh, so being prophetic in these situations uh, can be um, everything, basically. Uh, you're talking about who has the truth or who claims the truth, what is justice, uh, who's justice. These are difficult questions that we are faced with constantly in this land. Um, and, um, you know, like people who have more power can say uh, more things and can be heard more. Uh, but uh, we as Christians are called to care for everybody. Uh, and that's exactly where we come in as people of reconciliation, uh, as bridge builders, and as people who call for a just and lasting peace in Jerusalem and the wider Middle East. Yeah, respect the dignity of every human being. Uh, Amen. You know that's it. it and it, it, I mean, the, you, your diocese covers five countries. Um, do you get a sense of how some of the congregations in places like Jordan or Syria are um, navigating this moment, uh, or, or do you find that? Christians in all congregations are just sharing this sense of horror and trepidation about what's unfolding. Yeah, indeed, you know, I think, you know, by being in a diocese like Jerusalem uh, with uh, five different countries, and I'm sure that, you know, we have been hearing a lot about what's going on in, in Lebanon and, uh, and in Syria internally, let's, let's see. Um, and certainly in Israel and Palestine, that's four countries already uh, of the diocese that um, I would say that not constantly, but at least, you know, for the most part and for the last, uh, you know, few decades, you know, things have been very difficult uh, for uh, the people who live in these countries. They have witnessed wars, they have witnessed uh, uh, uprisings, they have witnessed uh, lots of atrocities and, and difficulties. So our people, in a sense, you know, they are trying to kind of make sense of their lives and um, just me and Rafa talking about our own lives that now I'm, I'm almost 50 and uh, um, for the last you know like 50 years you know of our lives we say what have we uh, accomplished what did we see what did we experience in our lives and we sometimes you know are quite not depressed but you know we're discouraged that you know like we spend our life just trying to manage a crisis that is around us and how do we adapt in places and in situations of first intifada, second intifada, uh, our parents before us, the Sixth Day War, and then the 48th War. And, and, and now it continues with, the, um, with war in, in, uh, in Lebanon in 2006. And then, you know, like we have two or three wars in Gaza, and now this one. Uh, and, and we ask ourselves, like, why do we have to go through all of this? And the same thing like other parts of the diocese where they also had to deal with their own issues as well. So when something happens in one area, let's say in Gaza or in Syria or in Lebanon, uh, I think the whole diocese just, or the whole region for that matter, uh, it just moves in, in, in agony and uh, in uh, these all sorts of feelings and like, like why the Middle East is always um, having all these troubles and to have to look, live through all these difficult times. I'm just giving you the feelings that, you know, we average people uh, talk about 
our human uh, experience, our lives, uh, that's spent in just kind of trying to kind of reflect and contemplate on the uh, violence and the, the, the needs that is, is all, all, all around us. And the diocese has to respond to all of this. You know, we continue, despite all what is happening, we know that, you know, we have a, a treasure that is called Jerusalem, uh, a place of uh, uh, hope and uh, the city of the resurrection that continues to inspire us that, you know, like that God has promised us uh, something much better than this. And we will continue to work uh, hand in hand as as churches um, in order to bring a better life to every human person. Uh, and that is, you know, part of our mission as, as, as Anglicans, as Episcopalians here in this region. Yeah, no, I, and that's so helpful when you sort of document the regional challenges and how the diocese must just, you know, share in the grief that, uh, of, of each part of the diocese. When, um, so, so uh, as you know, um, we have deep connections with St. George's College and we're we pray for them often, and we encourage every seminarian to make a journey to the Holy Land and be part of that program. And we encourage congregations uh, subsequently to, you know, bring groups. Um, and I appreciate this is a difficult question, really, because, you know, on the one hand, you know how pilgrim income is essential for the survival of not just St. George's College, but other institutions that you have a responsibility for. And simultaneously, you understand why those of us in the United States of America and elsewhere uh, worry about making a trip. Um, do, do you have any counsel about what rectors and leaders of congregations should be thinking about as they consider trips they might have planned for 2024 and what what advice you would give them thank thank you very much Jeannie. and, and I, I i do believe that you know of course you know we first of all we have to um, uh, adhere to the counsel we get from our uh, countries and our embassies and uh, to see uh, what is the security situation in every country we visit and certainly here in jerusalem with pilgrims um, but we need to kind of always be updated about the situation so we don't make um, arrangements that can uh, endanger us, of course. Um, uh, although I have to say, like, one of the greatest gifts of uh, the Holy Land that, you know, uh, pilgrims are always safe despite of everything that is happening. And as I said, you know, we hear about lots of things happening. But um, um, I would say, like, you know, almost entirely our pilgrims are always safe. They go back home. Uh, with wonderful experience. And this is something to be, I think, uh, proud of on all, all levels and all sides because we all take care of our pilgrims and our visitors. So that's, that's one thing that I need also to, uh, to mention. You know, I think you know, for the next um, maybe um, um, two months or so, uh, things will be uh, certainly difficult, you know, and people already started canceling um, their trips to uh, Jerusalem. That is a fact. Um, but I advise people just to cancel, um, not all at once, you know, like if people have something next year in January or even in December, not to cancel their trips, then to wait and see uh, how the situation will be. And they can always, within the um, a gap or the period that they can cancel their trips without losing any money, uh, of course, um, they can do that. So there's no rush to cancel trips uh, uh, in advance, like, um, months before, uh, just to wait and to get advice from their travel agents or pilgrimage operators and uh, to take a, a good decision. But at the same time, during these difficult times, and I want to recall our, you know, like what happened during COVID-19. I want to give any other example where everybody was in lockdown, we couldn't travel, and uh, our college and the guest house here uh, and other places uh, around the diocese were empty from any pilgrims or visitors. And we had also to deal with a lot of difficulties. But uh, the gift of, let me, if I may call it that way, virtual pilgrims, 
people who supported the college and the guest house and the diocese, and especially uh, our American friends who stood with the diocese in times of difficulty. And I hope that, you know, at this time, you know, in the absence, in the physical absence of pilgrims, uh, I urge our friends all over the world, our partners, and especially the American friends of the Diocese of Jerusalem, uh, you know, to uh, take the opportunity to see how they can help our institutions, especially our hospitals and schools uh, at this time, uh, in order to continue, because I can say that this is one of the most challenging times you know, in the history, in the modern history of the Diocese of Jerusalem. I can say at least in the last hundred years, you know, maybe uh, after the world wars, this would be one of the greatest challenges that we are facing at the moment. Yes, no, I mean, well, thank you for that counsel. And, um, and I want to return to your uh, invitation for us to fast with you um, and also, uh, I'm going to be encouraging people to give uh, financially to you, and we'll come back to that in just a moment. I mean, forgive me one small departure from the themes of these questions. Um, as you know, um, I have an English ancestry, even though I became an American citizen in 2010. And um, I woke up at 6 a.m. and I watched very intrigued as our alum walked up uh, with uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury and delivering the oil, I understand, um, and carrying the gospel uh, into Westminster Abbey. Uh, do you mind just taking a moment and just sharing what it was like? And do you think uh, Prince Charles and Queen Camilla will have you on their postcard <laughs> and Christmas card list going forward? You never, you never know, I, I guess, you know, but, you know, I have to say, like, you know, King Charles, um, I have known him for um, uh, quite some years, and we have had uh, different encounters, especially here in the Holy Land, when we had different services and meetings and pilgrimages, uh, where he is so fond of the Holy Land. And I think, you know, the invitation that came to um, uh, me specifically to be part of it, yes, of course, you know, I'm um, uh, indebted to the Archbishop of Canterbury, Archbishop Justin, uh, and, uh, and certainly to uh, King, King Charles' His Majesty as well, who um, has a deep passion and love for Jerusalem. Um, and actually, this is the first time ever that somebody outside the UK that takes, takes part in the, in the liturgy of, uh, um, uh, especially like I'm saying Anglican bishops, at least the liturgy. I know we had ecumenical partners as well who participated with a special blessing. Uh, but, it, you know, like it's the first time that such uh, um, inclusion and diversity in the coronation takes place. You know, the, the, there, there's two things about that, um, especially the holy oil, the chrism oil. Um, first, it was, it was blessed in Jerusalem. It just kind of, it began, the whole story began with the blessing of the oil in Jerusalem. It was blessed by the um, Greek Orthodox Patriarch in a special ceremony and service where the oil was consecrated according to the Greek Orthodox tradition. And then I had the privilege, and for the first time ever, that uh, an Anglican Archbishop goes into the Holy Sepulcher, and especially into the Edicle and the Holy Tomb, uh, to say a prayer, and I bless the oil there on the tomb of Jesus for the coronation. And that was, uh, first of all, an ecumenical celebration in Jerusalem that uh, we never witnessed before. So that was a great gift for Jerusalem. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, being there in, in Westminster Abbey and to hand uh, over the, the Bible and the chrism oil is, is such um, an honor and it's so humbling to be there at such uh, a great occasion. And just if we think about it, you know, like uh, not many countries do something like this. You know, uh, this is a great uh, witness, Christian witness, I would say. Uh, uh, all over the world, we, there are billions who are watching this service hearing the sermon, uh, hearing the oaths, uh, and, uh, and the Bible, and the readings, and everything. And I think this is, it was, for me, um, 
a great witness uh, to the love of Christ that you know we anoint uh, the king and the queen and uh, to celebrate a new um, uh, era, a new beginning in, in, in the UK. It's such, uh, and the Commonwealth, this is a great gift. And I think this is how I take it as a, a, an act of, in one way or the other, an, an act of evangelism and spreading the love of Christ through a, a Christian leader uh, in, in, in the world today. So that's, this is briefly, you know, like the feelings that I uh, had when I was uh, sitting there and walking in the procession and with all the regalia around me with the crown and, and other things. Yes, that's right. It, it, was, it was extraordinary. And, um, and one little mystery that I couldn't quite resolve in my own mind how you pulled it off, when I go on an aeroplane, I'm only allowed to take three fluid ounces. <laughs> How on earth did you transport the oil <laughs> from Jerusalem to London in three fluid ounce containers? <laughs> well, that's, that's, a good, that's a good question. Um, I see it's, 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 classi it's classified, you know, Dean Ma'i, and I don't <laughs> Uh, you know like what I but it was it was taken by you know what once we consecrated the oil we actually gave it to the consul general here in Jerusalem uh, who actually uh, sent it with a special convoy on a special uh, with a diplomatic bag into into the uh, palace that's how how it happened thank you very much <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> I, I, I hesitate to, um, I, I'm, I'm going to just, well, can I just ask you a question before I issue this <laughs> invitation? Uh, so, um, you've invited us to fast on um, the Tuesday the 17th, was that right? Yes. And pray. Um, just talk a little bit about what's your practice around fasting? Do, do you... Um, what, what's your practice around fasting? Do you abstain from food from six to six, or do, everybody does it a little differently? No, that's that's very true. I, I think you know with fasting, of course, we can name a lot of ways in which we can fast, um, like in in Lent. But I think at this time, you know, we decide to um, abstain from uh, food from uh, sun sunrise to sunset. That's basically in brief. But people can choose other ways, you know, like, like in Lent, giving up something that they really like. Um, but if they are vegetarians, of course, you know, they have to choose something else than meat and, uh, <laughs> in order to do that. Yeah. So but, you know, that's, the practice would be from, from uh, dawn till dusk. Dawn to dusk. And, and do you abstain from both food and drink, uh, like our Muslim friends yes. do? You do. Yes. Yeah. So... Um, I do commend that as a practice, uh, as an act of identification, solidarity with the work that the Archbishop's doing in Jerusalem at this time. Uh, and, you know, we, we have over 170 uh, watching the live stream as well as all the people in the room. Um, and I think it is important that we're ready to give. Do you have any advice about how best we give to your ministry at this time? You know, I think, you know, as, as, as Americans, you know, the best way to um, support the Diocese of Jerusalem is mainly, I think, especially at this time for practical reason, two things, you know, one is to continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. This is uh, an, an, an enormous gift that we can receive from all of you. Uh, and uh, the other way in, in which we can do practical things is to be in touch with the American friends of the Diocese of Jerusalem. Um, and they, they have their own website, and you can reach, you know, uh, Eileen, who is um, uh, our uh, director um, there, uh, and uh, also Bishop uh, Greg Rickles, who is the president of the American Friends. Uh, and I'm sure that they will tell you how best to help the Diocese of Jerusalem, especially at this time uh, that we are going through. I'll be pleased to reach out for them, and we'll disseminate uh, how best to do that because we're very eager to do so. Uh, it's late there. Um, I am going to ask you to do uh, a blessing if you, if you don't mind. Um, I'll invite seminarians and clergy who are alums to decide whether or not it's a valid blessing coming through the Zoom. Um, 
<laughs> but we will receive it as the gratitude. And um, you, but you just, as you conclude, you do need to know you're much loved by your school. And we marvel afresh at the work you're doing and the challenges you're facing. And, um, and be assured you're very much in our minds and in our hearts and in our prayers as you navigate this extraordinary season. So if you don't mind blessing us, please. Thank you very much again. And please before don't. I give the blessing, yeah. um, I just want to say thank you very much, Dean Ian, for everything that you're doing. Thank you very much, BTS, for your great witness for the last 200 years. Uh, you have blessed many lives and you continue to do so. So may God be with you and uh, from glory to glory, uh, God willing. The Lord be with you. And also with you. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Thank you, Archbishop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Archbishop and uh, friends. Uh, we meet in the chapel and be assured we will be praying for the Holy Land. Thank, Thank you. you. God bless you. Bye-bye. Thank you.